Hi, Scientistas. I'm Julia, one of the co-founders of the Scientista Foundation. It is my pleasure to be moderating our very first office hours. Scientista office hours are live stream conversations with STEM professionals across industries. Part of our mission is to connect you to prominent professionals across fields so that you can hear their experiences and ask them your most burning questions. Today, joining us for office hours is the brilliant Dr. Sujata Bhatia. Dr. Bhatia is a physician, bioengineer, and professionally licensed chemical engineer who serves on the teaching faculty of biomedical engineering at Harvard University. She is also one of our best advisors here as the, at the Scientista Foundation. You can read her extremely impressive biography right below this video. And for those of you who are joining us live today, you can also post a question at any point during this interview at the bottom of the screen, and I will ask it at the end. We also had many scientistas submit some brilliant questions in advance, which I will be asking Dr. Bhatia throughout the interview. So Dr. Bhatia, welcome to Office Hours. It is a pleasure having you. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks uh, for the kind intro, too. Great. Uh, my first question for you today is to have you start by telling us a little bit about what biomedical engineering is for those of us in the audience who don't know too much about it and what your research involves. Okay, sure. So biomedical engineering really is um, the field of engineering that deals with designing materials to improve human health. And so when you think about any field of engineering, any field of engineering uh, is related to applying basic scientific principles of biology, chemistry, physics, to basically make things that help people. Okay, so all engineers are motivated by helping people, by improving the human experience, by improving quality of life, and improving survival. Um, so biomedical engineers specifically have a very strong impact on improving human life by improving human health. And biomedical engineers can work at all kinds of scales. So biomedical engineers can work at the cellular tissue scale to, for example, design patches for wound closure and tissue regeneration. And for example, to design better drug delivery mechanisms. Tissue engineers also design methods for regenerating organs. Okay, so that's biomedical engineering at the cell and tissue level. Biomedical engineering can also operate at the organ level when we think about prosthetics. So we think about, um, you know, prosthetic limbs and so forth. And then biomedical engineering can operate at the organ level when it comes to pacemakers. Then you're involving electrical engineering principles. And then finally, biomedical engineering can be applied to improve entire health systems. So when you think about you know, big data and improving the healthcare system, improving healthcare delivery. Biomedical engineers certainly have a, a role to play there. So all the way from cells and tissues to organs to the human body to healthcare. That's fantastic. It sounds like biomedical engineering is extremely interdisciplinary and I'm sure that it requires quite a vast amount of background to pursue a, a career in this field. Um, what, what basic sciences do you feel are essential to your work today and where did you learn them? Mm. So, you know, I think that you are spend your whole life being educated and I don't think that education starts or stops in your life. But when I think about how I prepared for this career path, um, I started reading biology textbooks even when I was in grade school. You know, my parents would leave a lot of science and engineering textbooks just around. They would get them from used bookstores and they figured something would take. They never pushed me in one direction. And so biology was what really took with me. So I would say a good solid biomedical engineer needs to learn a lot of biology, a lot of molecular biology, um, ideally chemistry through organic chemistry. That I learned in college. I got I really got a solid chemistry education at the University of Delaware. Um, so I learned a lot of molecular biology, a lot of chemistry through organic chemistry, physical chemistry when I was at the University of Delaware. Um, physics is certainly important. Um, those are kind of the, the basic core and of course understanding your math, understanding your differential equations. When we think about the engineering half, 
I think it's important to have a foundation in thermodynamics, a foundation in fluid mechanics, um, and these are all things I learned in college. Now, beyond getting all of that foundational stuff, you know, so I've talked about basic sciences, I've talked about thermo and fluids and design, um, it's important to actually practice, you know, biomedical engineering, in my humble opinion. So I went out into the DuPont company, and I was a practicing biomedical engineer designing medical devices because that's how you really learn to build stuff. People sometimes ask me, what was your favorite course in college? And I had many, many wonderful professors. And if there's any UD people on this call, you know, uh, Dr. Munson, Dr. Burmeister, Dr. Olson were all highly influential people in my education. That being said, uh, the moment in my education that I remember most distinctly was when I was taking junior design and I first designed a heat exchanger because then it was like, wow, like I can actually take this stuff and design something that could be useful. And I remember the exact moment I was sitting in the computer lab working on this heat exchanger design as a college junior and being like, this is so cool, you know? Yes, definitely. I think that getting research experience really early um, is great to really show you what the career is like and to get you excited about the science. Uh, that sounds fantastic. Um, so what would you say you love best about um, biomedical engineering? Is it the um, research component or? Oh, that's right. You asked me about my research too. I should address that question. Um, so I'll talk about the research and then I will answer your question about what I like the best. Um, what I'm researching right now with students, um, you know, when I was at DuPont, we worked on these gels that could be used for wound closure. And right now I'm working with students to work on gels that can be used for drug delivery, for, on gels that can be used for cellular growth, um, on gels that can be used for cellular regeneration, electrically conductive polymers for tissue regeneration. These are all things I'm very interested in. Another topic I'm very interested in is the use of naturally derived polymers. So polymers derived from corn, soy, cotton, kenaf, bamboo, you name it. Um, you know, because there's a really big opportunity for natural polymers in medicine. So these are a couple of things that I'm really passionate about and that I work with students on. When you think about natural polymers and as well as some of the gels we're working on um, for drug delivery, for tissue regeneration and so forth, these are nice soft materials that allow the body to heal, um, which is really cool and you can tune them and they're versatile. Um, what do I like best about my work? Certainly building stuff is cool. Um, I got to do that in industry. Building stuff that has clinical relevance is very cool and I enjoy that very much. I enjoy the opportunity to work on materials that I know can impact human health. But there is another aspect to my career that I think I enjoy even more. Um, and I didn't discover that until I started teaching. And that is that, um, honestly, the best part of my day is if a student says to me, I didn't think I could do this before, but now I think I can do it. Or I wasn't sure I could be an engineer before, but now I think I can. Or I wasn't sure I could go to graduate school before, but now I think I can go. So there's that um, aspect of enabling other people's dreams. And to be completely honest, I think that biomedical engineering enables people's dreams on many levels. And teaching biomedical engineering enables people's dreams on many levels because we are working on devices that can help people. So we enable the dreams that everyone has of being able to heal and get better and, and tap into the body's natural healing mechanisms. We're enabling people's dreams as far as being able to leverage natural resources for important high value applications, but also on a day to day personal level, I'm enabling students dreams every time I work with a student and mentor a student. Um, so I guess fundamentally what I like about biomedical engineering and teaching biomedical engineering is that you really can make people's dreams come true. That's fantastic. 
Um, I know that you mentioned that you love mentorship and you tried industry and then you clearly made the switch to academia. One question that we hear all the time is students trying to decide if they'd prefer industry or academia and how to make that decision. Um, how did you make that decision yourself? What kind of led you to start out at DuPont and then um, move into a faculty, more advisory position? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of what happens in your life is luck. And um, although I think it was Roy Rogers who said, like, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And it's really interesting how I ended up at DuPont and how I made that decision. Um, you know, I was finishing up my MD-PhD at Penn. I was thinking, you know, do I want to practice clinically? Do I want to start an academic lab? Do I want to go to industry? And what attracted me to industry was the idea that I could work on a team on a product that would um, be able to help people, right, and, and, and get out there to market. So um, I was presenting, I was in my last year of graduate studies, I was presenting a poster on my graduate work at a poster competition sponsored by the American Chemical Society and the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. And there was a woman there, um, Sharon Haney, who worked at DuPont on biomedical materials. And I noticed her name on the list of organizers and judges. And I followed up with her afterwards and said, you know, could I talk to you more about your career? And one thing led to another and I was offered a job. Um, I loved industry, and I'll be completely honest, uh, if it hadn't been Harvard, I probably wouldn't have left DuPont because I was having a great time there. Um, I had great mentorship. I had great mentorship from the male polymer scientists I work with, from you know the females like Sharon Haney. Um, DuPont was great. I got to actually see a project I worked on. I got to see the product go to market. This was an omega-3 fatty acid product. So industry is a good place for you if you love teamwork, if you love the idea of working on something big. You know, like when I talk to people from IBM who worked on the Watson supercomputer, they feel exactly the same way. So I would be, um, I would be dishonest if I said that I never missed industry. I miss industry all the time. And deciding to return to academia, like I said, was not an easy decision, but you know, you don't really say no to Harvard, so it's been good here. Um, what I like about academia, I think academia is a good place for you if you like being around students, at least in the role that I'm in. My uh, role is much like, I like to compare it to Robin Williams and Dead Poets Society. If I live with students, I'm always around students, um, and I love that aspect. Um, so that's been my path. I think that for me personally, being in industry for eight years um, has made me a better teacher because I know what is important to employers. I know that people who can work in teams is important, people who can communicate, who can write, who can speak. All of these things are important. Um, just as important, if not more important, than having your basic science and engineering skills. So knowing how to present yourself is very important in industry. Um, knowing how to manage your career, knowing how to seek out a mentor. These are all things I learned because I had terrific mentors in industry, and I think they've made me more effective in academia. So I hope that answers your question. Definitely. I think you hit on a ton of very helpful information there. Mentorship and the importance of networking, and the differences between academia and industry, and how to tell which one you'd prefer. Um, I'd love to interject with a question from uh, a submitted question from one of our scientistas okay. who um, wants to know um, how, you know, you have this background, MD, PhD which uh, clearly opened doors in both academia and industry. She wants to know how you decided not to practice medicine con conventionally. This is Pornima, an engineer from Boston. All right. she, says, uh, she thinks it's interesting when women move into academia, but it's really interesting in relation to someone who has an MD. So I'll let you yeah. take it from there. Um, I loved patient care. People often assume that if you're someone who has an MD and is no longer caring for patients, that means that you must not have liked patient care. And in fact, it's just the opposite with me. I chose the career path I did because I loved my patients so much. 
and I loved my patients so much that um, I realized that the best way that I could impact patients was to work on better medical devices and to train the next generation of biomedical engineers. Um, because I, when I went around in the hospitals, when I was on my clinical rotations with all these fantastic physicians, um, I noticed that there were places where engineering could help. And I also noticed that all of the technology that was being used was enabled by engineers. And so I thought, gosh, I have this engineering training. Now I've been to medical school, so I have an appreciation where unmet needs lie. Um, let's combine those two things. You know, let's have a career pursuing medical devices. And that's what I chose to do. Do I miss patient care? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and maybe one reason why I'm generally happy, like my students tease me, they're like, Sujata, you always have this big grin on your face when you talk, um, is that I have been fortunate to have a career path where I had a lot of things that I liked a lot, and I just had to choose between all these things that I liked a lot, and that's a pretty good problem to have. Um, I think it's good if you like a lot of things. So I loved patient care. I loved my patients. I definitely found medical school to be valuable. Not only did I learn where unmet needs lie in medicine, but I also learned how physicians think, what is the mindset, how do you do differential diagnosis. So if a patient comes to you and says, I have chest pain, how do you list out in your head all the different things that chest pain could be, and how do you rule out the most dangerous things, right? Um, so that was all very useful. When I talk to friends of mine who are MD-PhDs who initially did decide to practice medicine, what they tell me is, well, you know, eventually I had to choose. Was I going to practice or was I going to focus on research, teaching, what have you? Because to be a good practitioner, I, you know, in my humble opinion, I think you need to be practicing 100% of the time. But the training is worth it. So I am a big advocate for MD-PhD programs. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, you definitely have a wealth of education and various degrees. We can keep tacking on uh, letters next to your name. Um, I'd love to hear which degree you feel is the most valuable for what you're doing now, and if there's anything that you'd change about your education path if you could go back and do it again. Hmm. That's a great question. Um, honestly, you know, all of my education has been valuable to me, for sure. Um, and if this is a tough choice to pick, but if I had to honestly pick the degree program where I really learned discipline and learned to think for myself, it would have to be the bachelor's degree in chemical engineering that I got from the University of Delaware. If I had done that degree and nothing else, I think I still uh, would have come out as a, a, an independent thinker who could solve problems. You know, the other stuff added to it. So, you know, getting a medical degree adds to it because you know how to do needs finding, you know how to talk to physicians. Getting a PhD adds to it because you learn how to ask tough scientific questions and answer those scientific questions. You know, getting the PE was nice because it was sort of putting a stamp on the fact that I had these engineering skills. But frankly, um, I went through a really, really rigorous undergraduate program in chemical engineering at the University of Delaware. And I think that more than anything else, taught me to think for myself and solve problems. I was very lucky in that my professors, uh, when I was in chemical engineering at Delaware, cared more about teaching us the material and less about um, sort of being well-liked, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was a really good thing. That's great, and I'm sure it's very encouraging to hear that you can learn so much even as an undergraduate with a degree in engineering for all of our undergraduates out there. Um, I would love to switch gears and go back to your topic of mentorship, which you brought up earlier. Uh, we have another question that was submitted by a scientista, um, Ashley Hedberg, who is uh, at Tufts, and she recently attended your Tufts panel 
and she says, you mentioned some of your mentors. Who was the biggest help to you and to getting to where you are today? Mm, the biggest help for getting to where I am today, that's a good question because there were so many people. So let me start chronologically. And I would say in 10th grade, I had a biology teacher, Mr. Dillner, who is very responsible for getting me to where I am today because he gave me confidence. So the biggest thing, in my opinion, that a mentor can give you is confidence in yourself. And so if you're meeting with the mentor and, and leaving feeling more confident in yourself, that's a good mentor. And he was a good mentor because he um, would give these little awards out when we would take these biology exams and he called them the frog award and like the tadpole award and, and they were for students who had done really well on the exams. They were just like these little certificates that were printed out on like a dot matrix printer. You know, but you would go home with your little frog award certificate. This was like my 10th grade biology teacher and you would feel really good about it. You'd be like, yeah, I know about biology. Prior to that biology class, if someone asked me, what do you want to do with your life? I would have said, I don't know. I like science, but I don't think I'm smart enough to be a scientist. Um, I would say maybe I will do something else. Maybe I'll be a school teacher, but I'm not smart enough to be a scientist. But after I finished his class, I thought, I'm smart enough to be a scientist. Um, so he is one important person. Other important people, uh, two chemists who taught me when I was an undergraduate, um, John Burmeister and Burnaby Munson, just such gentle souls. I mean, just such gentle, gentle souls who really, really would get excited every time an undergraduate would succeed, which was so cool. I have not seen that in very many faculty members. Um, and then I had another mentor, John Olson, as an undergraduate, who, um, you know, he was the kind of guy, he was a chemical engineer, okay, and so he would talk tough. I mean, he would be tough with you. I mean, he would, he would lay it out, um, but he cared. And that, you know, people often think, like, do you have to be, you know, go through training to be a mentor? Is there something special you have to do? I don't think so. I, don't, I mean, I never went through training to be a mentor or an advisor. I think all you have to do is just care and give people confidence in themselves and recognize the potential in people. So I've just named some people. Um, there are many others that I haven't named who I'm also grateful for. My Harvard colleagues have been great. My DuPont colleagues have been wonderful. I had one uh, colleague at DuPont, Gary Faguli, who was particularly wonderful. I had some great bosses who gave some great advice. Um, I had one boss, Patrick Ireland, who always had these great quips. You know, but honestly, I think a good mentor is someone who cares about you and sees your potential and wants to enable it. Let me say one thing and then I'll let you move to the next question because I don't want to be too long winded. But um, every time, this is going to sound really cheesy, but like every time I look into the eyes of a student, and in particular a STEM student, but any student, every time I look into their eyes, I can see the future. And for me, that's addictive. So uh, if I told you that there's a crystal ball and this crystal ball will allow you to see the future, then you would want to look at that all the time. And I want to be with my students all the time because every time I look at them, it's like I can see the future. So um, that's what I love about mentoring. Well, that was great. Um, I particularly love the last part that you added in about the importance of not only the mentorship you received, but of being a mentor yourself and um, implying how much you learn yourself from your students. Um, I'd love to have you offer any bit of wisdom about why you feel it's important for every scientista to be a mentor herself and to encourage others to follow in her own footsteps. Um, I know we were hearing a lot about this with Lean In um, and a lot of articles about the importance of being a mentor as well. I think there's a lot of, of good things about mentoring. Number one, um, when you see someone who's not as far along the path as you are, it makes you feel like, wow, I actually have something to contribute. Like all this training I've been through, all the life experiences I've been through actually could be meaningful to someone else. It's very easy to kind of like get caught up in the day-to-day, -day, like what's not going right, what did the boss say today, you know, what, 
up with this headache I had to deal with, and then not to realize how far you've come. So when you mentor, you realize that, well, wait, I did travel a path, and that path could be useful to someone else. Um, I think we have a duty to mentor. And honestly, I didn't realize that until pretty recently. I didn't realize that until I started teaching at Harvard because, you know, it's, again, you get caught up in your day-to-day. -day, you don't realize, wait a minute, I have to make sure there's a generation of scientists and engineers that are going to come after me and continue this work. Because if we think about all of the problems in the world, all of the global brand challenges, you know, the environment, sustainability, you know, improving health care, you know, these are all going to be enabled by scientists and engineers. In addition, um, even, if, like, even if there's somebody on this call, right, who's not going to be a scientist or engineer, it's at least important to understand science and engineering so that you can make good decisions, right? So for good public decision making. So it's kind of a responsibility to the public to mentor and bring along the next generation. But I also think it's very rewarding. When someone achieves something that they didn't think they could achieve and comes to you and says, I didn't think I could achieve that, but then I achieved it, it's like it, it touches your heart. It makes you feel good. Um, I think you'll be a happier person if you mentor, definitely. Like, like people, you know, they read all this self-help stuff, you know. I, I, don't, I don't really think you need to read self-help books. I think if you go help somebody else, like, you'll feel better about yourself. I was just at this conference in February where there was a gentleman. He was, the, um, he was an executive uh, for the World Academy of Sciences. And this is an organization that enables scientists and engineers in the developing world through mentoring relationships with scientists and engineers in the developed world. And someone in the audience said, you know, this is such a massive challenge, you know, that, okay, we're going to train scientists and engineers in the developing world. How do you do that? And he says, you know what? You do one good thing every day. And I feel the same way about getting more women in STEM. How am I going to get more women in STEM? It's such a mammoth problem. Well, if I just do one good thing every day, then it'll make a difference. So that's my message. Just do one good thing every day to try to bring along women in STEM for Scientista. That is great advice. I already feel more inspired to be a mentor myself and will definitely use that mantra throughout my day. I hope all of you listening will as well. Um, you mentioned uh, bringing up women in science, and I think this is a great opportunity to shift gears and talk a little bit about what it was like for you being a woman engineer. Yeah. Um, we have some great questions that were submitted, and I'd love to um, make sure that we get to them. The first one I have for you is um, from Shira Banji from Harvard. And she asks, describe a time when your intelligence was questioned because you're a woman and how you overcame this. Yeah. Um, so I think that one thing that we all have to deal with is when people make assumptions about us because of the way we look. Um, I have been fortunate to have been told that I look young, okay? Um, and I, you know, I wear dresses, I wear pearls, I, I like to look nice when I come to work. And I remember on my first day at Harvard University, I was sitting in the hallway and I was wearing a skirt and, uh, you know, a nice blouse and my jewelry. And someone walked by, and it was actually a woman. It was another woman walked by. And she said, are you new here? And I said, yes. Um, I'm waiting to meet with HR, and she says, oh, you're new here, so, you know, whose secretary are you? You know, who are you going to work for? And it was one of those rare moments where the exact right words were on my tongue at the exact right time, and I said to her, who do I work for? I work for the students. I'm an educator. And she walked away. And it was just so perfect. Like, it, it was just, you know, so I think a, a well thought out response that articulates your basic principles can be the best retort when someone sort of makes assumptions about you because you're a woman. More recently, you know, there have been certainly times where, um, for example, I was recently at a conference and, you know, 
some of the people organizing the conference assumed that um, I must be like a student attending from another country and I actually corrected them and said no actually I, I teach at Harvard University so um, you know there are polite ways to correct as well but you know when I said to that that woman you know I work for the students it was like articulating my principles and firmly but politely saying I'm not what you think I am you know um, and I wish that we had a world where people didn't make assumptions about you based on the way you look. And I think things are getting better. I think things are getting much better. But I still think we have work to do. Um, so for instance, the reason why I think that like someone like Sheryl Sandberg is a hero is because, you know, when I was growing up, when people thought of like what does a CEO look like, they would think of like a tall male you know, a tall athletic male. Um, or even sometimes in academia when you think of like, what does an engineering professor look like? What does a dean look like? You know, people have ideas in their heads. And one reason why I teach is because when students see me, it starts to break that image about what does a professor look like? What does a dean look like? Um, what does an engineer look like? Does that make sense? Definitely. And I think that these are themes that we discuss all the time at Scientista, and you hit upon all of them. Um, I have a great follow-up question here. You discussed a little bit about how you do wear more feminine clothes and pearls, and you don't want to really give up your femininity just because you're a scientist and, you know, to conform to the the norm. Uh, Sarah Tartaglia from Loyola University, Maryland asks, was there ever a time where you found yourself purposely downplaying your femininity in order to receive more respect in your field? And um, if you've ever felt pressure to do so, how have you dealt with this pressure? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, for better or for worse, um, when I was in graduate school, I was so busy that I cut my hair very short. I had very short hair. I, um, I didn't wear very nice clothes just because I was so stressed all the time. And then I gained weight because I was eating Dunkin' Donuts every day. It was terrible. I mean, my lifestyle was the least healthy lifestyle you could have when I was in graduate school. And I look back on those days and I'm like, oh, how did I do that to my body? Like, I will never do that to my body again. So because of all of these things, it wasn't really a conscious decision, but I definitely went through a period in graduate school where, frankly, um, I was not very attractive. And it's probably fair to say that people did take me more seriously in terms of scientifically they took me more seriously yes that is true um, and in fact I look so dramatically different now than I did back then that I've actually had the experience where I've like sent Facebook friend requests to people from graduate school and it has taken them months to accept the request because they are like I'm sorry I didn't realize it was you you know what I mean like that's how different I look um, did people take me more seriously? Yes, but there were downsides. One was um, I was less approachable. So there's a trade-off between being taken seriously and being approachable. And my students often say, Sujata, you're so approachable. So I think that in grad school, I wasn't really living in my own skin. You know, I was being somebody who I wasn't. And now I'm being who I am, and I feel good about who I am, and so that makes it easier for people to approach me. I think, um, you know, it's certainly important to be taken seriously, um, but if you're sacrificing a portion of who you are to be taken seriously, it's, it's not a good thing. So you first and foremost have to make yourself happy. And if cutting your hair short makes you happy, do it. If wearing your dresses and your pearls makes you happy, do that. I, I think as long as you're adhering to standards of professionalism, um, 
you should feel free to be who you are. And then other people will feel free to approach you. That's great advice. And thanks so much for sharing that story. I think we've all been there with the freshman 15 and can all <laughs> empathize with that. Um, yeah, at Scientista, we definitely believe that, you know, hopefully over the time, the association with femininity and professionalism can become strengthened because it's definitely something that still society seems to be struggling with at some level. And um, we, we definitely agree with um, everything that you said. Um, Sarah has another question related to um, being a woman, but a little bit different gears about uh, balancing work and personal life. One question that I think we start thinking about way too young is how are we going to balance our careers with family and finding a husband and all of these kinds of things. Um, Sarah wants to know, do you ever feel like you had to sacrifice your personal life for your career and how do you balance these two things? Yeah, you know, what I, I think, this is my opinion, I'm sure I'm not speaking for all women when I say this, but I think we do a lot of damage to uh, recruiting women in STEM when we give messages like you can't have it all. I get really upset when I hear professional women telling young women you can't have it all. That is not true. You can have it all. You just have to decide how much time you want to spend on each portion of it all because there are only 24 hours in a day. But let me say this, you know, one thing that a lot of people don't know about me, because it's not in my formal biography that's published on the web, is that um, when I started my career at DuPont, both of my parents were sick. They, on, I think it was the very first day of my work at DuPont, my dad said, I don't feel well, um, I need to go to the doctor. Two weeks later, he was diagnosed with kidney cancer. So it started literally right from the start of my career at DuPont that I had ill parents that I needed to take care of. They are well now, thank God, uh, thanks to the miracles of modern medicine and other scientistas and scientists, um, they're fine, they're both cured. Uh, but I was, I was taking care of them. I was accompanying them to doctor's visits. I was you know, doing everything you would do when you have a parent who's sick because somebody has to take care of them, and I was the closest geographically. Um, and so, did I balance that with my work? Absolutely. Um, now that might sound like an extreme situation, but it's really not. We all have our personal challenges. Um, as far as balancing my personal life and my professional life now, I got the best advice ever from one of my bosses at DuPont, Pat Ireland, and Pat said to me, you know, Sujata, the definition of success is having a work life that you love so much that you literally have to tear yourself away from it to go home and then having a home life that you love so much that you have to tear yourself away from it to go back to work. And I actually have that right now. Now my home life of course consists of the students who I mentor and live with as a freshman proctor in Harvard Yard. But I do have a boyfriend. He might be listening in on this chat. I told him about it, and I think he's listening in. But, um, you know, we certainly have time to spend together. We, um, you know, we go out. You know, we watched a movie on Netflix a couple nights ago. We're certainly planning to have a family together. Um, how am I going to balance it? Well, you know, students make great babysitters, you know. Um, so I think you can have it all. I love my personal life. Uh, I think it's important when it comes to having it all um, that you find a partner, whether it's a man, woman, or even if you're going to be, you know, a single parent, whatever, you find people to surround yourself with who support you. And it took me a while. You know, I dated a lot of jerks before I really became wise about finding a guy who would support me. Um, so please, 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 this is just my little personal relationship um, tip, do not date a jerk. Like, don't do it. Don't do it. Like, don't think you're under a time crunch, number one. Number two, if there's a career path that you, like, love, 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 like, I love, love, love my engineering students, the last thing I want to hear you say, this is going to be sound like, I'm, I'm going to sound like stern parental sujata for a second, but like, I do not want to hear any young woman say, 
I did not pursue this career because I was afraid about how I would balance it with my life. If you want to be a pediatric surgeon, damn it, go be a pediatric surgeon. If you want to be a scientist running your own lab, be a scientist, run your own lab. If you want to be the dean of freshmen at Harvard University or some other you know, elite university, by all means do it. If you want to be a company CEO, do it. Just find what you love and do it. And then you'll figure it out. You're a smart woman. You'll figure out how to balance it. Surround yourself uh, with people who support you. But do not think that you can't have it all. You can have it all. You just have to choose your path carefully and you have to choose the people you associate with carefully. I hope that helps. Thank you. I think that is really inspiring advice for anybody listening. Um, I, I definitely love your message saying that you can have it all and we don't have to choose. And even the distinction you made about you know, personal life and personal problems and how, you know, that can seem like such a struggle, but if you really just work through everything, um, you can make it happen. And thank you so much for sharing all of that personal experience for everybody listening. Um, I, I'd love to just add a little bit to that. I, I know that you are here now. I think everyone watching thinks, wow, you know, she made it and she's balancing everything and you seem so confident. Were there any times when you did doubt yourself or doubt the direction you were going. Um, maybe if you could give an example of an obstacle or a doubt that you faced and how you overcame it when you were young and you still didn't know that you'd uh, make it to the point where you are now. Yeah. So, um, you know, there are certain times of crisis. Um, in graduate school, I think it's unusual to go through graduate school and not have some very serious periods of doubt. Because, you know, you go from undergrad to graduate school, you know, in undergrad, you're sort of, you know, you're, you know what's expected of you, you're doing your classwork, um, and then you go to graduate school and you're around all these really talented people. I went to Penn for grad school. and you're just one member of a lab full of very talented people and it is easy to doubt yourself in that atmosphere especially depending on what your lab's atmosphere is um how did i overcome it you know it kind of goes back to that theme of mentoring so and surrounding yourself with uh with positive people so when i was in grad school at penn i mean i had self-doubt all the time i mean you're you know you're at an elite med school you're at an elite grad school i mean surgeons would yell at me and they'd be like you know what are you doing because i was slow you know i was thinking about everything like an engineer not a surgeon you know i was slow sometimes in the clinic uh you know again i i felt less than confident about my skills as a PhD student, but I was lucky because I was mentoring uh, this freshman floor of students who were interested in science and technology at Penn. It was called the Science and Technology Wing. And so uh, every day I would come home to these freshmen who would like think that I knew something. And you know, when I defended my PhD thesis, the room was filled. I mean, it was packed, it was standing room only. And it was standing room only because, um, not because it was filled with faculty. I mean, my, you know, my advisor and my thesis committee were there and, and, and many of the people in my lab were there. But it was filled because all the students I had mentored at Penn over the years, over the four years, uh, came to my PhD thesis defense. And that, it sounds weird, but it was like these people who were younger than I was helped me build confidence, again, to rebuild the confidence I had lost. Um, when I was at DuPont and my parents were sick, I kind of wondered if I would be able to handle it all. And again, uh, it was seeking out mentorship. Um, my friend Gary Figuli gave me some great advice and he would be like, you know, Sujata, in your life, like things are just gonna happen. And, and you're not going to be able to control them. Um, so, you, you know, you just have to just get through every day until things get better. And, and that's kind of like the way it was. I still have doubts about myself, even on a daily basis. And I, I think that one reason why students like me is because I've never been afraid to show that vulnerability. 
So, you know, I think we all go through those kinds of periods, but my most serious periods were certainly in graduate school and, and a little bit of DuPont. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I think that was uh, really valuable to hear how you worked through your doubts and just knowing that it's okay to have doubts and that that's normal part of the process and you can still um, do amazing things if you just work through them. Um, I know that one doubt that many of our listeners must be facing is being a woman in engineering. Uh, Amanda Brodsky from Barnard asks you, um, in your field in everyday life, how does it feel to be a woman in biomedical engineering? Do you still feel gender stereotypes in your field, or do you see that society has is progressing beyond these stereotypes? I know you touched upon yeah, this. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. Like, first of all, I would say on a daily basis, it feels pretty darn good. Okay, so I say, like, when I open the Harvard Engineering website, or you open the Yale Engineering website, and you see how many men there are and how few women there are, it makes you feel pretty damn good that, like, you're one of them. Um, and so anytime you can represent, I think it makes you feel good. Um, I think there is room, like I said, like, I was a little bit, like, you know, sassy with the one person when I said, you know, I, I'm, I work for the students. I don't work for, you know, somebody else. I'm not somebody's secretary. I work for the students. You know, they're my boss. Um, I think there is room to be a little bit sassy, and, and but yet nice. I don't think you have to be mean to get your message across. I'll give you one more example. Recently in email, a colleague asked me to do something. And uh, he put at the end of the email, uh, oh, and you'll get extra bonus points if you do this, this, and this, too. And I was like, that's a really interesting statement to make. Like, this person's thinking I should be getting brownie points from him. You know, I was, it was a very interesting statement to make, and I didn't know how to interpret it. it. You know, it's like, well, could you please do this, this, and this, and bonus points if you can do this and this. And I thought, hmm. So what I did was I said, well, I, what I did was I actually having my own little competitive personality, I did what the person asked me to do, and then I exceeded it by a lot. Um, and I returned it that night, and I said, I did what you asked, and I also did, you know, X, Y, and Z more that you didn't ask me to do. And then I said, did I get the bonus points, and what did I win? And then I said, it happened to be, the timing happened to be a few weeks ago after I had uh, published an article in the Huffington Post about women in STEM. And I said, I think I know what I won. It's an article about women in STEM in the Huffington Post. And I sent him the link. And, and it was a kind of, a, it made him laugh, I'm sure. And he wrote me back and said, haha, nice article. Um, you know, and you know, I didn't want to make assumptions about what he meant by his comment. But I felt like by responding to it in like a humorous and slightly sassy way, like I think humor and being a little sassy can often kind of diffuse that tension. You know, I could have gotten uptight and been like, who does he think he is? You know, I'm not getting his brownie points. But instead I was just like, let me just get my message across another way. And let me send him this link because he needs to read this article. <laughs> so that's what I did. For any of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Bhatia, wrote an article, a letter to her former self, and I'll be sure to post the link somewhere on this screen when oh, I for <laughs> the recording. Um, that's great. We are close to running out of time, and I want to be sure to get in some of these great oh, questions, so I'm just going to run through them in the time that we have left. Oh, sure, sure. Um, so they're a little bit out of order, but um, here, we'll just go through them. Uh, so Angelica uh, Leon from Barnard also asks, um, uh, how did you acquire the position that you have today? And um, how many positions did you have prior to this current job? And were they beneficial or advantageous in shaping your current career? So I, I, we also got a, another question about how you uh, came about working at Harvard. So I think that's... Um, you know, yeah, I can tell that story. Um, that. <laughs> I think there's a lot of value to spending an extended period of time at an organization. 
Um, and so prior to coming to Harvard, I was at DuPont for an extended period of time. I was there for close to eight years. So I gained experience in bench research and development, product development, preclinical trials, clinical trials, intellectual property. Uh, it was great. And so here I had this nice big experience at DuPont. And I had started teaching part-time at the University of Delaware um, and finding that I loved teaching and that I loved being around engineering students. And so um, Harvard advertised for a position on higheredjobs.com. And I applied. And you know, the first time, I don't think I got a response. But then the job was reposted six months later. And I applied again. And when I applied the second time around, I sent in a copy of my teaching evaluations from the University of Delaware, which were really, really strongly positive. And then the second time, I got an interview. And then the interview led to the job offer. Um, so I think there is value to, so, and when I think about my own career plan, you know, I hope to be at Harvard for an extended period of time. I, you know, ideally like to spend the rest of my career here. That'd be really nice. Um, and, you know, I think it, it, it helps to learn about an organization by being there for an extended period of time but at the same time be building skills that are marketable outside of the organization so you know um, take your job seriously enough that you are planning to be at that place for the rest of your life when I was at DuPont I really thought I was going to be there for the rest of my life but then this even better opportunity came up um, so take your job seriously, take your organization seriously. I know I sound old school when I say that, but like do approach your job as if you're going to be with that organization for the rest of your life so that you can take it seriously. But at the same time, be building your skill set such that if you lose your job tomorrow, somebody else is going to want to hire you. Uh, it's a good position to be in if you can call the shots and say, I'm leaving this job now to go to this next job. And, and that's what happened when I moved from DuPont to Harvard. I think that is great advice for anybody on the call, definitely focusing on skills. And um, I'm sure that we have so much left to see about where your career takes you. Since oh, thanks. <laughs> feel so young. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. uh, that is great. Um, we have another question from Gloria in Palo Alto, okay. and she uh, says that she's always wanted to have her own lab, but um, like I think you've mentioned earlier, she has been doubting her own abilities. She says, sometimes I wonder if I'll be able to constantly come up with new experiment ideas. Uh, do you ever have doubts like this? And if so, how do you overcome them? Yeah, you know, I think that the more you learn, the more ideas you'll generate. Um, and so I don't really have a shortage of ideas as far as, um, you know, projects that I can work with undergraduate students on. I, you know, shortage of ideas has never been a problem. So I think if you're a curious person, once you start asking questions about a particular process, more questions will naturally come up. Um, and I would tell Gloria that, you know, not to worry. You know, sometimes we all worry, like, am I creative enough? Am I going to do something new? Um, well, find a place where maybe you can get some basic lab stuff done. Maybe you could start, uh, and I don't know where Gloria is in her education, but let's say she's never had any lab experience. Then start in a place where perhaps the mentor is going to give her a project to do, assign her a project to do. I guarantee guarantee after one semester working on that project, she's going to start having some ideas for how to take that project further. Um, so it's the more experience you get, the more ideas you get, the more questions, you know, it's like when you answer a question, it just raises more questions. I think that's great advice for Gloria and um, for all of us just to get a lot of experience and uh, keep our creative juices flowing at all times. I think that's a huge part about being a scientist. Um, we have uh, one good, I think, concluding question from Angelica, which is, what is the single most important piece of advice that you would give female college students who want to enter your field? Hmm. Um, first and foremost, I would say believe in yourself and really mean it. Uh, I cannot emphasize that strongly enough. Um, believe in yourself. I don't like to hear it 
when undergraduate students say to me, well, I'm just not good at math. Well, I, I just don't think I can come up with good ideas. Well, you know, get rid of that negative self-talk. You have good ideas. Um, you can be good at math if you work at it. You can be good at engineering if you work at it. If I went in and took the professional engineering licensing exam without studying for it, I would fail. Okay? I am not a super genius. I'm just a hard worker who didn't give up. So believe in yourself and really mean it, number one. Uh, number two, uh, 2020 today. What I mean by that is if you have a goal that you want to accomplish by 2020, treat it like you're trying to accomplish it today. You know, don't lose sight of it. Um, and then thirdly, I would say, you know, love the people around you, whether it's your family, your students, your mentors, your mentees. Um, because when I think about my best memories um, from DuPont, my best memories from Harvard University, my best memories from the University of Delaware, from the University of Pennsylvania, they all involve people. Um, so think about that as well, like the importance of special people in your life. And that's why it takes so much time to be around other people. I think I might be like addicted to being around other people. But anyway. Great. Thank you so much for that concluding advice. Um, I, it's just hitting 4 o'clock now, so we're concluding our office hours. Okay. And again, thank you to everybody who joined us live and for everybody who is now watching this as a recording. Um, this was our, office, our first office hours with Dr. Sujata Bhatia, and I know I've learned so much from this, and I hope that you've all learned a lot as well. Um, we'd love it if you could leave us a comment and let us know what you thought and um, share the video and share the tips that you've learned from Dr. Bhatia with other female science students as well. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.